In this section we're going to be looking at Taylor polynomials or Taylor series. Now we already looked at Taylor polynomials in an earlier lecture when we were trying to use polynomials to basically estimate or polynomials to represent a more complicated function like a square root or a log or an exponential. So let's go ahead and review a bit about Taylor polynomials. Now what we're going to do is once we write the Taylor polynomial, we are going to try and rewrite it in terms of summation notation and have it represented by a series. So if we have some function f and we're able to take n derivatives of it, and this particular polynomial is centered at c, then we have a particular algorithm that we can follow to create a polynomial called a Taylor polynomial. Now this polynomial that we're looking at, that formula, is Pn of x. This n has to do with the number of derivatives we take and the degree of the polynomial. So this is going to look like the function evaluated at its center, x minus center to the zero over zero factorial plus the first derivative evaluated at its center, x minus the center to the first over one factorial. And again, we've actually done this before, so we have this formula already that we've worked with. I just want to make sure we rewrite it so it's in the, these notes as well. Now this function process will continue up until the nth derivative, so fn of c, x minus c to the n over n factorial. So if I want a fifth degree polynomial, to use for my estimation, what I would do is I would take five derivatives and kind of follow through with this process and fill it in. Now the idea today is to take this further and look at the number of terms until we can rewrite it as a pattern and then say, okay, yeah, let's look at this and rewrite this in series notation. So a couple of things to note here is that this expression then is called the nth Taylor polynomial. Now we, what we want to do is follow this pattern and we want to be able to write this in a series. Now just a quick note, we have something called a Maclaurin series. A Maclaurin series or a Maclaurin polynomial, either one, is exactly a Taylor polynomial centered at zero. So it's kind of just like a special case there. So if you run across Maclaurin, the first thing you need to do is think about, oh, its center is zero. And that's what we want to focus in on. So let's just go ahead and look at a lot of examples. This is really the only new information that we have right now when we're working with these. So first of all, let's go ahead and look at f of x equals three or one over three plus four x. And what we're asked to do here is to find the first four non-zero zero terms. Now when we talk about non-zero terms, sometimes your first term might be zero, so they're saying beyond that one. So we want to find the first four non-zero terms, and then we want to write the power series using summation notation. So that's our summation notation. And then I'm going to find the interval of convergence, the radius of convergence, and in this case the center, but we already know since it's a Maclaurin, um, the center is zero. So here's the function that we're working with. And again, for this particular case, I want to be able to find a Maclaurin series. And all the Maclaurin means then is center equals zero. Okay, so we need to be able to find those first four terms, and then if I can look at that pattern in the first four ter terms, my hope is that I can take that pattern and rewrite it using summation notation. Okay, so if you recall back from our Taylor series, we had a specific way that we did this. We had to find derivatives, and then we had to evaluate at certain values of c. So we had f of x, in this particular case is one over three plus four x, 
which is 3 plus 4x to the negative 1. That's the form we want to get it in before we start taking a derivative. Now our first derivative, I bring the negative 1 down, decrease the exponent by 1, and then multiply it by 3, the derivative of 3 plus 4x, which is 4. In rewriting, it looks like that is negative 4 times 3 plus 4x to the negative 2, and I'll also rewrite this in terms of a fraction, getting rid of that negative exponent, 3 plus 4x quantity squared. Now I'm not sure which form will be easiest to work with here, uh, but I'll leave them all in these different forms. Let's go ahead and look at the second derivative. I'm going to leave some space here. Well, I guess I could evaluate these as we go. So let's go ahead and evaluate this at 0, because again, it's a Maclaurin series, so the center is 0. This would be 1 over 3 plus 4 times 0, 4 times 0 is 0, 0 plus 3 is 3, so this would be 1 third, so f of 0 is a third. Now down here, f prime at 0 would be a negative 4 over 3 plus 4 times 0 quantity squared. 4 times 0 is 0, 0 plus 3 is 3, 3 squared is 9, so this would be a negative 4 ninths. Okay, now we had to find the first four non-zero terms, so I have 1, 2 so far. Look at our second derivative. Now for the second derivative, I'm going to work from up here. So I'm going to have the negative 4 out front. I'll bring the negative 2 down. I'll decrease the exponent by 1, and then I'll multiply it by the derivative of 3 plus 4x, which is 4. So this is a chain rule. Okay, pulling everything out front, a negative times a negative is a positive. 4 times 2 is 8. 8 times 4 is 32. 3 plus 4x to the negative 3. Okay, and I'm going to write it in both forms, because usually in fractional form it's easier to evaluate. So if I evaluate the derivative, it would be 3 plus 4 times 0 cubed. 3 cubed is 27. So 32 over 27 is the coefficient that I'm looking at there. Okay, let's find the fourth non-zero term. Now the fourth non-zero term doesn't mean the fourth power, because the first power, or the first term, is to the zero power, if you notice here. So let's go ahead and look at our second derivative. And I'm going to go off of this for my second derivative, using the simplified form as best. And again, on your handwritten homework in your exams, you have to show this process. You can't just write down a derivative magically, you have to show the process of finding that derivative. So I bring the negative 3 down, I decrease the exponent by 1, and I multiply it by the derivative of 3 plus 4x, which is just 4. Okay, so from here, what I need to do is to rewrite this. I'll rewrite it a couple different ways. First of all, 32 times 3 is 96. 96 times 4 is 384, and I have a negative 384, 3 plus 4x, to the negative 4. Now if I want to rewrite that, because it's easier to evaluate in a fractional form, I can. And then I evaluate this at third derivative at 0. So it would be a negative 384, 3 plus 4 times 0 to the 4th power. I think I wrote that wrong. 4th power. So up here, where I have 2nd power, I need to fix that. That's to the 4th power. Okay, so simplifying, I have negative 384. And 4 times 0 is 0. 0 plus 3 is 3. 3 to the 4th is 81. Now I think negative 384 over 81 will reduce a little bit, and sometimes that's helpful to reduce these so your numbers don't get so large. And I think this reduces a 128 over 27. Now one thing I would warn you about is when you're working with these, after you reduce them, it's harder to see the pattern. For instance, 81, 3 to the 4th is pretty obvious. It reduced to 3 cubed, so that might kind of throw your pattern off. So make sure you re look at it in reduced form and non-reduced form when looking for that pattern. Okay, so this one was f prime at 0. This one was the second derivative at 0. And this one was the third derivative at 0. And I think I'm missing a prime mark up here, so this is the third derivative at 0. 
So now to find the polynomial, I'm following that formula that we have from up above. So this is going to look like P um, 4 and equal 4 here. We'll, we'll wait to fill that in in a moment. Equals. Okay, so f of c. f of c was 1 third. So this is going to equal 1 third x minus 0 to the 0 over 0 factorial. Okay, let's look at our next term. Our first derivative was negative 4 ninths. So this would be a negative 4 ninths x minus 0 to the first over 1 factorial. Plus, looks like we have 32 over 27 times x minus 0 squared over 2 factorial plus, actually it's going to be a minus, and I'm going to leave this in the non-reduced form, negative 384 over 81 x minus 0 cubed over 3 factorial. And the reason I'm going to leave it in this form is it might be easier for me to figure out what the pattern is. So if you look at our highest power, 0, 1, 2, 3, I can see that this is p3 of x because I'm looking at the highest power here would be my third power. Okay, so let's try and see if we can find a pattern here. So if I look at the pattern, I can definitely see the powers are involved. And it looks like to me I can simplify these terms a little bit. So 0 factorial is 1, x to the 0 is 1, so this is just 1 third minus 4 ninths, x minus 0 is just x, x to the first is x. And then over here I have this 32 x squared over 2 times 27, 2 factorial is 2 times 1. And then I have this minus 384 x cubed over 3 factorial, which is 3 times 2 times 1 times 81. So there's a bit of a simplification. Again, I'm still trying to figure out what the pattern is. So simplify one more step. Okay, so 2 goes into 32 16 times. So this would be 16 x squared over 27. Okay, so now I have quite a bit that we can reduce here. If we look at this, it looks like to me 384 over 81 both of those are reducible by 3, so this would become 81 divided by 3 is 27, 384 divided by 3 is 128, and then 2 goes into 128 as well, it goes in 64 times. So I have a lot of canceling occurred there, but it looks like I have minus 64 x cubed over 3, I have a 3 left and a 27, so 64 over 81. Okay, so as we're working here, this is the first non-zero term, this is the second non-zero term, this is the third, and this is the fourth non-zero term. And notice the negative sign would go with that fourth non-zero term and the negative sign would go to the second. Now what we want to do is look at this and write it in summation notation. So it looks like so far starting maybe, um, I'm going 1, 4, whoop, there's an x here, so this x is right here. 1, 4, 16, 64, those look like powers of 4 to me, so 4 to the 0, 4 to the 1st, 4 squared, 4 cubed, but notice as I look at the cubed, it's 1 less than the term number. Okay, so that's something to think about. Let's go ahead and start our indice at 0 to begin with, and let's see if we need to adjust it. I know it's alternating, and I know it starts positive, so we could start with negative 1 to the k, k to the 0, anything to the 0 power is 1. So our first term would be positive and then our second term would be a k equal 1 would be a negative. So that looks like it's working. Now from here, it looks like I have 4 to the k. Okay, so 4 to the k, 4 to the 0 is 1, so that would work perfect here. 4 to the first is 4. 4 to the second is 16, so that looks like it works. And then if you notice, my power on my x is the same, so I'm going to call this x to the k as well. Now my denominator looks to be a power of 3. So this is 3 to the first, 3 squared, 3 
cubed 3 to the 4th. Now my powers aren't running the same as they did for the 4th. So if you notice up here, this was 4 to the 1st, but down here this is 3 squared. So I'm going to have to compensate by adding a 1 here. So there's my series, and you can run through a few terms to make sure it works, but that's basically the series that we have. Now we're going to do one of these where I test the interval of convergence, but for the most part we've already done those in previous sections, so I want to focus more on finding the terms, writing the series, and then of course you can go back through and check for the interval of convergence. But for here, I'm going to go ahead and do one where we'll find the interval of convergence, and radius of convergence. Well to do that we'd use the ratio test. Now remember we're looking at the absolute value with the ratio test, so I'm looking at the limit as k approaches infinity, the absolute value, and the ratio test is saying the next term divided by the current term. Well I can ignore the negative because I'm taking absolute value, so I can ignore that. So the next term would be 4 to the k plus 1, x to the k plus 1, all over 3 to the k plus 1 plus 1, which would be plus 2. And then I divide it by my current term, but when you divide by a fraction, you're actually just multiplying by the reciprocal. So this would be the limit as k approaches infinity. So this is be 4 to the k, 4 to the first, x to the k, x to the first, and I'm just going to multiply straight across here, 3 to the k, 3 to the first. And I'm writing these out separately because a lot of times these get incorrectly simplified. And so I want to write out so you can see where everything comes from. Okay, so let's see what cancels here. It looks like a 4 to the k, uh, 3 to the k, x to the k, and then this 3 will cancel with one of these, leaving me with a 3 overall. So this looks like the limit as k approaches infinity of... What are we left with here? 4x over 3. And this is absolute value. And it looks like to me all the k's canceled. So if all the k's canceled here, everything else can be considered a constant. So I can pull the 4x over 3 out front, have to keep it in the absolute value. I'm left with the limit as k approaches infinity then of 1. The limit of a constant is a constant itself. So I have the absolute value of 4x over 3, and I want to force this to converge. So it has to be less than 1, because if you remember the ratio test, it converges when that is less than 1. So to find my interval then, I'd go ahead and rewrite. So I'd have negative 1, less than 4x over 3, less than 1, and then I'd multiply through by 3 fourths to clear the fraction, so it'd be a negative 3 fourths less than x, less than a positive 3 fourths. So right now my interval of convergence looks like negative 3 fourths to 3 fourths, or negative 3 fourths to 3 fourths with parentheses if I want to use interval notation instead of the set builder. Now a couple of things, I need to still check my endpoints. Always have to check your endpoints if you end up with one of these intervals that are not either point convergent or for all real numbers. So let's go ahead and check with x equal negative 3 fourths. Now remember this has to go back into our original function, my original series. That was a ways up here. So this was my original right here. Remember I wrote this one, we came up with this after we looked at the series. So that's going to look like 4 to the k, x to the k, That's a little bit much. So I have that negative 1 to the k, 4 to the k, x is a negative 3 fourths to the k, all over 3 to the k plus 1. Okay, so in place of the x, I put in the negative 3 fourths. And it looks like to me I could probably rewrite this to make this a little bit easier to work with. So we want to get this into a form where I can use one of my s convergence series to test. So the negative 1 to the k I'll leave for now, I'm trying to figure out what's going on with that. Now here, if you notice, the exponents are the same, so I can combine this as one fraction. So I can take the exponent 
And remember, I can distribute the exponent across a product, but not a sum or a difference. So that term can be rewritten as 4 times negative 3 fourths quantity to the k, and that's over 3 to the k plus 1. And again, we can still rewrite this a bit. k equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the k. Now the 4's cancel here, and I'm just left with negative 3 to the k. over 3 to the k plus 1. Now we can simplify this some more. So that negative 1 to the k. Now let's think about this. This would be negative 1 to the k times 3 to the k using that same reasoning of being able to combine these. So I can split them back apart. So I have negative 3 to the k. So it would be a negative 1 to the k times 3 to the k. And I can see that the more I can simplify this, the easier it might be able to test because this is quite a, quite an expression here. So rewriting, I have negative 1. When you multiply like bases, you add exponents. So k plus k is 2k. And then I have 3 to the k. And then 3 to the k plus 1 is 3 to the k times 3 to the first. Now, lots happening here. Negative 1 to the 2k, whenever you multiply something by 2, it becomes even, and a negative to an even power is always 1. So this term is always 1. The 3 to the k's cancel, and I'm left with, finally, not much. Um, what is left? Well, it's just 1 third. Okay, so this is the series I want to check. So lots of simplification. I'm going to use the divergence test on this. So if I take the limit as k approaches infinity of one-third, that's equal to one-third, which does not equal zero, therefore it diverges by the divergence test. Okay, so at that endpoint, k equal negative three-fourths, I have that it diverges. That means no bracket, no equal sign there. So that's kind of what I'm looking at. Okay, so next, Let's go ahead and check x equal positive 3 fourths. I'm checking the other endpoint. These are kind of fun to simplify. Okay, so this would be k equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the k. Let me see if I can remember this. 4 to the k, a positive 3 fourths to the k, over 3 to the k plus 1. Now we're going to want to do the same thing. We're going to want to simplify it. So k equals 0 to infinity. So this would be negative 1 to the k. Now this would be 4 times 3 fourths quantity to the k over 3 to the k plus 1. The 4's cancel here. Now this one looks like it's going to alternate. So this would be a negative 1 to the k. 3 to the k over 3 to the k, 3 to the first. And then I have my 3 to the k's canceling. And the series that I have left to simplify and test then would be an alternating negative 1 to the k over 3. Okay, so I would test this using the alternating series test. So the first thing I need to show is that this is either decreasing, or if you want to think about it as non-increasing, you can as well. And you can either do this with a derivative, um, or you can look at this in terms of fixed and increasing. Well, if you look at this in terms of the alternating series test, this doesn't seem to be decreasing, it seems to be constant to me. It's always one-third. So condition not met. However, we're lucky that the second condition, the limit as k approaches infinity of 1 over 3 is equal to a third, which does not equal 0. So this condition is not met either. However, the divergence test kicks in. And we just showed by the divergence test, 
So this is divergent, so therefore this is divergent by the divergence test because that limit is not equal to zero and I showed that up here. So what we have then is it's converge, or sorry, divergent at that endpoint as well. Okay, so these are long problems. So summarizing or concluding, we have the interval of convergence was negative three-fourths to three-fourths or set builder notation, negative three-fourths less than x less than positive three-fourths. We have the radius of convergence. The radius of convergence in this case was r equal three-fourths because the center was at zero. And so from the center at zero, we can see that it's three-fourths to either endpoint. So this is one of these problems. They're long, they're interesting, they're kind of fun to work with. I like being able to take those and rewriting them in series notation. But of course you have to be able to run through quite a few derivatives and everything to get to that point. But this is what you're going to be doing over and over again for these. And it's going to be a really important skill to have. So the more of these problems that you work, the better. So for the last few problems that we look at, I'm going to focus more on writing these in series notation. And then I'll leave it up to you to check for intervals of convergence. Okay, so let's go ahead and rewrite in series notation. Now if they don't tell you how many terms, basically you just need to determine, you know, take a few derivatives, write out a few of the terms, and see if you can find a pattern. And the sooner you can find a pattern, the fewer terms that you're going to have to write. So we want to take f of x equals 2 over x, and we want the center, or a, at 1. So this is a Taylor. So f of x is 2x to the negative 1 f prime of x is negative 2x to the negative 2. Second derivative is 4x to the negative 3. Third derivative is negative 12x to the negative 4. And the fourth derivative is 48x to the negative 5. So maybe I'll need more, I don't know. So as I rewrite these, again this is just 2 over x, so when I evaluate this at 1, that's just 2 over 1, or 2, so this is f of 1. Over here when I rewrite this, this would be negative 2 over x squared, so f prime at 1 would be a negative 2 over 1 squared, which would be negative 2. This is 4 over x cubed, so the second derivative evaluated at 1, sorry that's an x, would be 4 over 1 cubed, which is just 4. Then over here I have a negative 12 over x to the fourth, which we have our third derivative then at 1 would be a negative 12 over 1 to the fourth, which is just negative 12. So this would be 48 over x to the fifth. So our fourth derivative evaluated at, at 1 would just be 48 over 1 to the fifth which is 48. So if you notice that power in the denominator, the 1 squared, 1 cubed, etc., doesn't really seem to matter. So now that we have these, let's go ahead and rewrite our polynomial. So Pn of x. So that's going to be equal to f of c, which is my f of 1. So this is 2x minus my center, which is 1, to the 0 over 0 factorial. So again, I want to start this pattern right away. So I have minus 2, x minus 1 to the first over 1 factorial, plus 4, x minus 1 squared over 2 factorial. And again, I can keep going with this until I can start to see a pattern. x minus 1 cubed over 3 factorial. And I'll kind of stop here to see if I can kind of scope this out and see what's going on with the pattern. But this continues on. Okay, so I definitely think we can simplify this, so let's go ahead and look at simplifying this. Anything to the 0 power is 1, 0 factorial is 1, so I'm just left with 2 for my first term. Minus 2 quantity x minus 1. I'm not going to just distribute that 2, that negative 2, I'm going to leave that as is for now. Now 2 factorial is just 2, and 2 goes into 4 twice, so I'm left with 2 x minus 1 quantity squared. Okay, 3 factorial is 3 times 2, which is 6. 6 goes into 12 twice, 
So I'm left with minus 2 x minus 1 quantity cubed. 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. 4 times 3 is 12 times 2 is 24. 24 goes into 48 twice. Huh, that's kind of interesting. It looks like we have a 2 everywhere. So plus 2 quantity x minus 1 to the 4th. Now remember, this pattern continues. So it looks like I don't need to worry about a denominator. And it looks like the constant is definitely a 2, and I definitely have that x minus 1 going on. So let's go ahead and start rewriting this. We definitely have a series notation. If I want to think about this, this is starting with the 0 power, x minus 1 to the 0, x minus 1 to the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, so that looks good. And it also alternates. So I have a negative 1 to some power I'm going to have to work with. I have a 2, and I have an x minus 1 to a power. I'll start my indice at k equals 0. I want to start positive. Negative 1 to the 0 is 1. 1 times 2 is 2, so that works. x minus 1 to the 0 is 1. So that works for my first term if I start with a k here. So this is my power series that represents the function 2 over x. And then from here what I can do is I can use my um, ratio test to find the interval of convergence. I can find my radius of convergence. I can find all those different things. So the process here is long. You're going to be expected to be able to do these, so you make sure you practice a lot of them. Uh, just don't Google your answer because on a test or in your handwritten homework you're graded not on the answer but on your work. So spend this some time figuring these out. They're not too bad. They do take a lot of paper and a lot of patience and time. And some of these take quite a bit of arithmetic. And if that does show up on an exam, it will be a doable amount. Um, you know, you might be expected to reduce functions, take powers of functions, and some basic things like that. Good luck and have fun with this section. They're long problems, but they are very interesting.